this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 273 looking at the top 10 cards from Shadows over Innistrad. I'm super excited about this set. It comes out this next weekend. This top 10 list is obviously being done before I've had a chance to shuffle any of the cards. If you disagree with me, please post your own list in the comments. I learn as much from the individuals watching this channel as I do from the greater magic community. So I'd really like to hear if you believe I've missed any of the cards or you think a prediction here was just crazy. There's a lot of honorable mentions here. As I was putting this together, I really gained a lot of respect for a few of these cards on the honorable mentions because of Craig Wesco's really good top 20 list over on TCG Player. Craig Resco is a much more competitive player than I am. He's one of the top Pro Tour players in the world. So as he puts together his list, it focuses a little more on impact on standard and what cards are going to be played. Olivia, I had really missed entirely in this list. I wasn't impressed with a 3-3, but I am much more of an eternal player. Vampires could be really strong in standard. Niari, I am also not that impressed with but could fit into the right deck. And that's what's really gonna matter with her is does she find a deck? Now, Craig is a huge mono white player and I see the value in the captain here. If there's a mono white aggro deck, this card is gonna be great. Now, the Abby here is a personal pick of one to watch. If there's a way to get out a bunch of tokens really quickly, a 9-7 flying lifelink indestructible with haste is a monster clock. This is really a fixed dark depths. It is going to see a lot of rogue deck builder brewing going on. I would pick up a foil one just to have for ETH because it's a fun card like that. The other honorable mentions that I've got here is Trista Decaphobia. Absolute coolest flavor card ever. I've got a whole video on that. Check that out. Descent Upon the Sinful. This is not going to be playable the first two, three weeks. This is going to be playable once people figure out what the control deck is in the environment, and then it's going to be very good. The Lieutenant here is another one that could really fall into that aggro deck style and Transverse, the Uvavald. Very interesting, cool ramp card there. I like it a lot. I didn't put the lands on the list. These lands are very good. They're going to be standard staples for years to come. And the big question is, are these playable in modern? And I believe the answer is yes. They're going to see play as a one of or two of in modern. This doesn't make them an all-star, but it does help you with things like choke or boil the fact that they come into play untapped on turn one as long as you've got a basic or even a non-basic in your hand of these land types helps a lot i like these as much as i like the scars of mirrodin lands which are often a one of or two of and occasionally even a four of in modern I don't think these will be a four of in modern, but I can definitely see them as a one of or two of, which means you should look at picking up the foils. Number 10 spot here, I've got the new Hydra. And this poor little guy, everybody has to compare him to prime time. He's obviously not prime time. Primeval Titan is one of the most broken cards ever printed. You cannot compare the Hydra to Primeval Titan. The Hydra is going to be a good card. It's going to be a card that sees a lot of play in the EDH because Primeval Titan is banned. This is a card that I'm looking at picking up the foils and enjoying. It may even see a little bit of play in a ramp deck because it can get very large and block those pesky angels that we're going to be seeing a lot of. Number nine. But here, I've got a card that I've been waiting for for a very long time, a flip planeswalker that is a werewolf really really cool what i like about her the most is that she can protect herself by putting out a wolf right away and can protect herself on the other side by dealing damage to creatures or players this is going to be a great aggro card possibly even a control card although red green doesn't usually lend itself to control this is a wonderful flavor card this is a card I look forward to playing and having a lot of fun with. The number eight spot here, I've got Declaration in Stone. This is not your path to exile or swords to plowshares, but when it comes to standard, 
this is a powerhouse. This is going to see a lot of play. The fact that it exiles creatures is really nice. Additionally, giving your opponent the clues is not a big deal if you're just going to kill them before they get a chance to capitalize on those. This is the type of removal that is designed for an aggro deck. Number seven spot here, I've got Sorin. And Sorin is wonderful for standard. Six casting cost means that he's probably not modern playable, but great for EDH. The fact that he can protect himself the turn that he comes out, that he can gain you life, and possibly even gain you a significant amount of cards if you've got an empty board state or a board state where he can be defended. This is what I want in a Planeswalker. Ability to control the board, gain life, and gain extra cards. The number six spot here, I've got Relentless Dead. This is one of those cards that the value really scares me. If there is a Suicide Black or a really fast black deck, or even a black deck that sacrifices creatures and does some crazy stuff, this will be a staple at a four of. And it's a Mythic. Mythic two twos could have huge value. I'm looking for ways to brew with this card. I would definitely pick them up at a reasonable deal if you believe that they're going to be played in standard. I don't know if they have any playability in modern, but in standard, this could be a powerhouse. Number five spot here, I've got one that has topped a lot of other people's lists. This is Avacyn. Ooh, Sarah Angel has come a long way since she was created, and we have a 4-4 flash flying vigilance. When it enters the battlefield, all of your creatures become indestructible, and if a non-angel creature you control dies, transform her. And then when she transforms, she does damage to each other creature and each other opponent. The utility on this card is amazing. This is an EDH staple in any Boros deck. This is going to be a beautiful foil overall. This is going to see a lot of standard play. This could be the top of the curve in an aggro deck. This could be part of a mid-range deck. I really like this card a lot. No modern playability or limited modern playability at that five casting cost. Overall though, this is a very flavorful, wonderful, fun looking card. In the number four spot here, I've got Jace, the Unraveler of Secrets. And people have been a little bit harsh on Jace saying that he's way too slow at a five casting cost. This is another card that suffers from being compared to one of the best cards ever printed, Jace the Mind Sculptor. This Jace has almost everything you want in a Jace. Five, loyalty. That's a lot of loyalty. The ability to draw a card. And you scry before drawing that card. That means you get the best of the top two cards from your library. Really, really nice. Now, the emblem here, whenever an opponent casts their first spell, each turn counter that spell. That is the type of emblem that is meant to play in a control deck. It doesn't win instantaneously, but it makes it extremely difficult for your opponent to do anything. A lot of the criticism that I've seen against this card being too slow, people have missed that we've got Thing in the Ice, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, in this environment, putting out a 0-4 blocker and then having this guy late game to help you transform that thing and have a very fast clock is going to be very strong. I don't think he's going to see a lot of play really early. I'm going to wait for him to drop a little bit. Then I'm going to pick mine up for standard and brew in either Esper or maybe blue red, maybe blue white. The number three spot here, I've got Anguished Unmasking. And this is another card that is suffering a bit of criticism because it's not as good as Vindicate. Once red deck wins, dies down, which red is going to start out really strong as it always does when we have a standard rotation. After that, this could be a very, very powerful removal card. I like this a lot in standard. Vindicate was clearly too powerful because it hit land. This is a very balanced card. It's also instant speed, so you can do some wonderful combat things with it. I'm happy with this card overall and I look forward to playing it in a deck with Sorens. Sorens got the ability to gain life. One or two other life linkers in that deck, and this loss of three life is going to be negligible. The number two spot here, I've got one that's going to be pretty controversial for people, Sin Prodder. I expect this card to be all over the top eight list the week after the release. It is not Dark Confidant, but... It does get you extra damage. It's a 3-2 
with the menace. This is what you want at the top of your red deck wins curve. The ability to hit for three unless they double block. The ability to start doing extra damage right away. Let's say that it's a land that's flipped over. That land may go to the graveyard, but you didn't want to draw that land anyways because you're at the top of your curve. You wanted to draw gas and this gets you into gas. I'm a huge proponent of Bob Bolt, which I have played in Modern and in Legacy. Fun deck, very straightforward. Getting those extra cards though gives you a lot of depth and Sin Prodder is going to do that in standard. Red Deck Wins is gonna be a powerhouse right out of the gates. Number one card that I've got here is Thing in the Ice. And not because of its impact on standard, because it could be very playable in modern. A zero for the type of creature that blocks some early robots, blocks goblin guides, lives through lightning bolt, is exactly what you need to stabilize. A tempo deck that cycles through cards very quickly could flip this very fast. A control deck that has this to stabilize and then win is another really nice way to play this. The only thing that's really rough about this is that if it gets vapor snagged back to your hand, you gotta start over. Is this card as good as Tarmogoyf? Which is a bit of a theme here, is comparing these cards in a new set to Eternal Staples. Tarmogoyf is always good off the top late game. Thing in the Ice may not be good late game, but is such a good early drop to help you stabilize that long term I really like thing in the ice. I don't know how you're going to get it to work though in standard. So the $20 price tag that it currently sees, I believe is a little bit inflated. I would wait for a bunch of these to get opened, be able to figure out that it might not be playable in standard, or at least not until standard figures out what the best control deck is. Pick them up at around 10 to 15, and then long term, they could have a lot of value to them. I look forward to bring with this card in modern, especially. To avoid the wrath of the purifier, subscribe to the channel. Thank you. This has been Brian Ryan with Mythic MTG Tech. Thank you to everybody who helps make the channel happen. Greatly appreciate it. I've still got patron pack openings to do before the end of the month. I'm trying to get those in here in the next few days. April is going to be crazy. I plan to do a lot of videos. I've got a birthday coming up in April, and I've got some announcements around that. Take care. Talk to you all soon. Choose the cards wisely.